Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is TIL about ally, which just means today I learned about accessibility. So sorry about the acronyms. I can't spell, so that's why I chose this. And it also fits nicely horizontally on a slide. So if you want to follow along or if you want to reference these slides later, they have some somewhat useful links, uh, barcamp a 11 y .netlify.com. Um, I'll they'll be hosted forever as long as Netlify lives. So. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, I'll probably like knock it off at some point or hit my coffee onto it. Anyway, hi, I'm Jake. Um, this is me, and if it loads, my two sons, Milo and Oliver. Um, internet. Yeah, it's slow. Anyway, uh, I was born and raised in Omaha. I write JavaScript. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, at Jake Partouche. I work for a company called Object Partners. Um, we're sponsoring today, so thanks, Object Partners. Um, I'm a consultant. I, I write web apps for companies around Omaha and Lincoln area, uh, some remote. Um, I've been developing for seven-ish years. Um, and so six weeks ago, my accessibility journey started. Um, before that, I didn't really know or, I guess, care about accessibility. I mean, I knew a few things. Um, I knew that screen readers were a thing. Um, I had never used one. I didn't, I, they were kind of scary. Um, I, you know, you install some software maybe, or I don't know how they work. Um, I knew that websites should work without a mouse. Yeah, that, was, that was pretty good. And I knew that semantic HTML was also good. This is six weeks ago, me. So right now, I, I, you know, I'm like the guy that took the class last semester, teaching the class. Um, so yeah. Um, so six weeks ago, I, I joined a client. And basically, my sole job was to fix accessibility issues. So uh, I didn't know anything. I had to learn six, six weeks worth of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of trying to combine all that down for you all today uh, in the top you know, five or six things that I learned. And hopefully, uh, we can all learn something. So well, the first thing, um, so for web, web development tools, um, the, best, the best tool that I found uh, for static site analysis uh, is Axe. So maybe if I can open this up. Um, so Axe, oh no, I need to be on. One second. I don't, I don't have it installed on my incognito browser. OK, so Axe is just an extension you can install that's made by DQ. Um, and it shows up when you, in, in your Chrome developer tools. Um, and you can run an audit on any page, the page that you're currently on. Um, so that's really cool. So let's go. I'm going to drop this, and I'll just talk loudly for a minute. So I'm going to go to my personal website, which has accessibility issues, obviously, because I just learned about this six weeks ago. Guy, this fine-looking fellow. All right, so you can see kind of over here. This is really small, but there's five or 17 issues. 14 of them. 14 of them are color contrast issues, which may or may not be uh, false positives. But um, you can see that Axe just at a glance gives you like, hey, these are the things that you should fix, and you you. You can uh, kind of put that as part of your regular workflow um, to you know, just catch those things automatically. Uh, so that doesn't require any interactions or anything with your website. It just like, statically analyzes your HTML and tells you what to fix, where it found it, and you can learn more. So it's a really great tool. Um, if you've used Lighthouse before, um, Lighthouse has accessibility as part of their um, you know, tool set. 
but that just uses X under the hood. So uh, at first I was like, oh, I'll just run Lighthouse on every page, but that does like a full page refresh and everything. Um, this you can just like, if you need to get to a specific state in your page, you can just get to that state, run X, and then you know you get the results. So that's super useful. Um, so if you don't learn anything else today, X, X. All right, so next is keyboard. So just as you're developing, um, key through your, your website, make sure that you can get to everything, do everything with just a keyboard. Um, which is kind of, I knew that, I knew that. That was the one thing I did know before, before I started, so that was good. Um, and screen readers. So really there's three major screen readers. Um, JAWS, which works on Windows only and is expensive. Um, NVDA, which is free, Windows only works well with Firefox, and VoiceOver. So I, I develop on a Mac, and VoiceOver is built into Mac OS. And I didn't know it, but um, all you have to do is press Command F5, and your screen reader pulls up. So let's see if I can, there we go. So now I have my screen reader up. It has this nice little text box. So you don't necessarily have to have your volume up to, to listen to it, um, and then I'll just I'll be use this as we go through the slides, and we can kind of see what, how different things announce. But voiceover is awesome. Um, phones also have screen readers built in. So, um, like, let's see. So I have an Android phone. All you have to do is hold down the power, the both the not the power buttons, the volume buttons at the same time, and then it turns on and it starts talking. Maybe. Yeah, it's talking. It's very quiet. Trust me. All right. And then uh, VoiceOver also works on iOS. So um, that's great. So we have a screen reader we can use to kind of see how things are announcing. We have the keyboard to navigate. And we have Axe to catch our static stuff. So we're doing great. All right. So the first thing I learned about, which I had no idea, uh, is SkipNav. So let's look at the. WCAG 2.4 guideline. Before we get into that, WCAG is like the guidelines for accessibility. So there's three main levels, uh, A, AA, and AAA. Uh, so A being the you know, minimum, you know, your website should do these things. AA being um, it should do all of A and these extra things. And AAA being it should do all of A, AA, and these extra things. So uh, most like government websites are AA compliant. Um, and you'll see that as a requirement for maybe if you are building a, a, a website for a, a client or something. Um, lots of times you'll see AA. Not a lot of times you'll, will, will you see AAA as being the minimum requirement. So, um, so let's look at this. So bypass blocks. You should be able to bypass blocks of content that are repeated on each page. Uh, so one common thing with web pages, oh great, all right. So one common thing with web pages is the nav bar, um, and you'll, you should be able to allow your user to skip over the nav bar to the main content. So when the page loads, they don't have to go through all of the links every time. So uh, I kind of built one into here, and a lot of times it'll just look like this. You press tab. So the first element that's focused on the page, skip to content, it skips the nav bar uh, to your main content. So I didn't know this was a thing, so I started going to some websites. And like, hey, people have been doing this, so good job, people. Um, so Starbucks has a skip to main navigation. You press tab again, skip to main content. And so yeah, good job, Starbucks. Um, so I, I write React code mostly. Uh, this is a nice, uh, nice component you could use to just embed that in. So you put it at the top of wherever like your page rendering is, and um, it'll give you that link, and you link it to the main content. So also page titles. So another thing I didn't know um, is that every page should have a unique title. Um, so this is part of the WCAG. 2.4 guideline, which is pretty generic. But um, basically, this kind of goes hand in hand with SEO, because each 
each of your pages should be uh, uniquely titled so that your user, without having to look at the content of the page, can tell what that page is about. Um, so you can you can like you don't want your users to have to interact with the page to be able to know like is this the right thing that I should be on. Um, another nice library actually made by developers in the NFL. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing NFL.com developers. Um, React Helmet, so you can uh, modify your page title along with a bunch of uh, meta content on your site uh, via React Helmet. So, sorry I'm using a bunch of React um, libraries, but that's just what I use, so it might be useful for you. All right, headings. Another thing that's also good for SEO is to make sure that your headings are in order uh, and also have meaning. So. This, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense because like accessibility and SEO kind of go hand in hand because they are just tools. Um, you know, web crawlers don't really know much about your web page. Um, they're just looking at the content to try to discern what what is it about, and that's the same thing that a screen reader is doing. It's trying to figure out what are the main topics of this page. Uh, so headings can be used uh, to give the user a good glance of you know what what is this page about. Uh, what are the subsections and, and all of that. So, so you should always have an H1. Every, every page should have an H1 to tell what the page is about. Uh, H2s are usually good for uh, subsections of content. Um, maybe you'll have an H3, uh, but you probably won't ever have an H4 or H5 or H6 unless you're writing some like documentation website or like news article or a I don't know, a dictionary app, I don't know. <clears throat> so yeah, definitely use H1s and H2s. Um, you might have noticed that I didn't on my website. I think these are H4s. Lazy. And I didn't want to like adjust the font size. <laughs> so I just, I, I think I th that's, that's like, I, I realized a lot of my past problems where I was lazy. Um, and I think maybe maybe you all can relate, but yeah. All right. These should be not headings at all because they're not headings. Alrighty. Tab index. So thanks to HTML, semantic HTML, um, we get in, we get tab index on these these elements by default. So anchor, button, input, selects, and text areas. So that's great. Um, those are like the main interaction points with your site. Um, if you find yourself creating a button with a div, you probably shouldn't. You can, but uh, it's all the like semantic meaning of a button uh, is the, you don't really realize how much uh, goes on in a button uh, until you try to make one with a div. Um, because a button should be selectable with a space bar or an enter bar or enter key, um, it, should ha it should announce itself as a button so you can know that you can interact with it. It needs a tab index so that it's tabbable. Uh, but if you just use a button, the button HTML element, you don't have to worry about any of that. It just does it for you. But sometimes you might uh, have a div that requires a tab index. Like one common uh, use case for this is if you have like a scrollable area that has a bunch of text in it. Um, so you can do tab index equals zero. Uh, that'll allow the uh, user to tab to it so they can scroll within that content. So that's a common use case I've seen um, for like stuff like this. You can also control the tab index. Uh, so it will go to one element and then the next by incrementing the number. Usually that's not a good idea uh, because it should match the visual order and if it's not matching the visual order, then your DOM's probably messed up, and other things can probably uh, just not read correctly with a, a screen reader. So, um, is everyone able to hear me? Okay, cool. So, focus trapping. Another thing I didn't know um, was that like modals and and things that pop out on your page should trap the focus within them. Uh, so, for example, this modal is a sub subscribe. Um, so if you were just to make this modal with uh, like HTML div and like uh, fixed positioning and like all that, um, you could make it look like this. But 
as you tab through, you might tab and then like go outside of your modal. And then it's really it's like impossible to get back into the modal. Uh, so you want to trap that focus to the modal itself. Um, so in this case, the focus is trapped. It only stays within the modal. Um, and then, then you should also be able to get out of it with an escape key. So focus, trap, react is a good library for doing all of that hard work of making sure that the focus stays within that um, react element. So this goes for like slide menus, um, yeah, things that kind of like take over the page. Um, you want to make sure that your focus stays on the foreground and not is can't get lost in the background somewhere. Aria Live. So this is the first time we've talked about Aria so far. Yay. Um, <laughs> there's like a million different Aria dash whatever. Um, yeah, tags, but really, if you're using semantic HTML, you don't have to use a lot of them. Um, it's good to look at different roles if you have a, a weird uh, widget or something that uh, is doing something um, maybe non-standard. Um, so Aria Live is for content that appears and disappears within your document. Uh, so a common use case for this is like a snack bar or a, like a toast message. Um, so I'll pull open the screen reader. So when I click this button, there's going to be a, like, a little toast message that comes up in the corner. And we want that to be announced to the user so they know, like, hey, something happened. Um, so yay, hey, something happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, it it's keeps the focus on that button, but it just lets you know, like, OK, you did something. You got a confirmation. Um, so you don't, like, you're not like sitting there waiting for something else to happen. Uh, so Aria Live is, is useful for like just telling the telling the user, you know, this thing changed, or you know, you might want to be aware of this content. So um, there's a couple of different settings for Aria Live: um, polite and assertive. So polite will just won't interrupt what's going on currently, uh, but it, it will eventually announce itself. Um, assertive will just like interrupt whatever you're doing and announce itself. That's good for like error messages, like system error, you know, things are on fire. Um, that might be a good message, or assertive, uh, might be good for that. All right, and animation. So there's a setting in the browser. All browsers support it now, uh, or the green browsers, probably not IE, uh, support it now. Um, prefers reduced motion. So you can toggle that in your browser settings uh, so that it should disable your animations. The way you can make that work in your web app is to add this media query. Um, so apply it to all elements, animation and transition, none. And hey, a use case for you know exclamation important. So <laughs> we want to override all animations on the website when they don't want uh, when they want to reduce motion because you know you you want your users to have a good experience. And if they don't want animations, then don't show them animations. So. Yeah. All right, so I have a bunch of the other things that I learned. Uh, labels are important, so inputs uh, should always have a label, a visible label, too. So you can't use a placeholder as, an, as a label because the placeholder goes away. Um, so one thing that like Material UI does, I'll sc scroll back. So they have the input placeholder go up to the top, so it's always visible. So it's always visible, and like the user can use it for context as they're typing. So that's great. Thank you, Material UI. Um, error messages. So if you have like inline error messages, you want to make sure that as the user is typing through, that those get announced to the user, probably using Aria Live. Um, color contrast. So one thing that I learned, which is cool, is Chrome Dev Tools has color contrast um, checks built in. So all I have to do, so if I'm highlighted on this contrast, I can scroll down to wherever the color set, which is here. And if I open this up, it has the contrast ratio. So the contrast ratio is different for different uh, compliance. So AA for this text size is 3.0 3 
contrast, whatever that means. But this is 21, so it's better because it's black on white, which is like the best contrast. Um, and then for double or triple A, it's 4.5. 4. So Axe will kind of alert you to potential areas where you might have contrast issues, but then you can use Chrome Dev Tools to like dive in and see like, okay, um, how far off am I? What can I maybe tweak? And then as you tweak the stuff, it'll, it'll adjust the contrast ratio for you. So it's just a nice, easy way to, um, to debug that. Um, so all of these WCAG requirements, they have a quick reference that I've been linking to. Um, so you can kind of read through these. And just like reading through them is, was, I don't know, enlightening to me. Like I didn't, didn't know half of these things. Um, and I should know them, so um, yeah, here's the reference for the 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 uh, requirements, but and then it, it denotes level A, level double A, um, and all that. so all right, so as you're developing, use Axe first of all, preferably automated. So uh, one thing I did is I used Cypress, um, which is an end-to-end -end testing tool, to go to each page and run Axe. And then any errors that happen, it'll fail the end-to-end -end test. So that's that's awesome. It it you can do it on your um, when new code gets merged or on PR or whatever, um, or you can run it manually as you're developing too. That's that's fine. But you you kind of want to make sure that you don't have regressions as well. Uh, so use a keyboard and use a screen reader. Um, it's easy to use a screen reader. Uh, so just yeah, just do it because yeah. And do this all during development. Don't like put this on your QA team. Um, this is something that we should we should own. So, but yeah, that's all I have. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, so, I can't remember. What is the stance on like multiple H ones on a page? Uh, I think that they're typically not. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's recommended okay. because H one should represent the page itself. Yeah. And then H2 should represent different sections of the page. I can, yeah. yeah, I couldn't remember if like your section of the page. Yeah, like it's kind of like a tree. Yeah. I think it's kind of like a tree. So. And then one other one. Uh, do you know with, if a button's disabled or like text is disabled, does mm. that have to meet the contrast ratio? Um, I think technically no. Okay. Um, I, but there's so like with all this, there's different schools of thought. So some people would say yes. Um, but I think, according to the guidelines, um, not technically. It, it, I, like disabled is one of like the exclusions in the in the guideline. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? We have one minute. I know you're React, but are there Angular libraries for this, or other framework libraries? Yeah. So some most of these things are built on like generic JavaScript libraries. So like the Focus Trap React is built off of the Focus Trap. JS library, so yeah, there there seems to be at least a handful of just JavaScript generic libraries. Yep. Um, have you seen how people balance like the design aspect with the accessibility? And are people able to successfully do those really well? Um, so yeah. That's a good point because like some accessibility issues can only be like caught in the design stage, um, so it's kind of like working with your UX team designers or whoever that may be to to kind of work out how that flow might happen like beforehand before you start development, um, so you don't have to go back to the drawing board um, to fix fix things. So cool. Thanks.